Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. I am at a conference at the Kennedy School of Government in a room filled with women from post-conflict countries all over the world. 20 Hutu and Tutsi women are taking turns telling their stories of the Rwandan genocide. In roughly 100 days between April and July of 1994, more than half a million Tutsis were murdered. Estimates of the total death toll are as high as 1.1 million. I am hardly breathing. Most of us are sitting in shocked silence. Some are openly weeping. Just when it is all truly unbearable, one of the Rwandan women calls for a dance. A dance? I am frozen in my chair as they rise as one, move away from the conference table and begin to sing and sway together a call and response song in Kinyarwanda, accompanied by beautiful undulating movements. Up, up, they insist, and I rise, my heart so heavy. They smile approvingly. We have lived to tell you this story, they say. We have lived to befriend one another. We will die at peace. In fact, this wasn't a one-time event, day after day, every time the storytelling was too much to bear. Someone would call for a dance. Someone would remind us to be grateful. I don't know how they did it. How they buried the dead and adopted their neighbor's orphaned children and carried on. I cannot imagine. But I do know that remembering to give thanks for life changed the energy in that room and somehow made it possible to go on. At the close of the conference, my new friends gave me a beautiful piece of material which they showed me how to tie at my waist to create a long skirt. For dancing, they say, remember us. Mrs. Klein, a teacher in a deteriorating school in a depressed neighborhood, asked each of her first grade students to draw a picture of something for which they were grateful. Even as she did it, the lesson felt hollow. She knew she would get turkeys or Thanksgiving tables laden with food because that's what's expected of them, but their lives were not bountiful. Mrs. Klein showed the class each of the pictures that they could talk about gratitude. A sad boy named Douglas, Mrs. Klein's little shadow when they were outside for recess, had drawn a hand. Let's guess whose hand this is, she said. The class was captivated. I think it's the hand of God that brings us food. It's a farmer's hand. They grow the turkeys. It's the pastor bringing turkey. Douglas remained silent. When the class was busy on their next project, Mrs. Klein bent over his desk to ask him whose hand was in his picture. It's yours, Mrs. Klein. And then she recalled the way she so casually took his hand sometimes, a six-year-old bearing the weight of the world. Mine, she asked. Thank you, he said. Gratitude gets us in the habit of paying attention to the things going well in our lives, 
says Emiliana Simon Th Thomas, who co-teaches an online course about happiness to some 580,000 students at Berkeley. It's a recognition that these things are not always a result of your own prowess or genius, but of other people or a higher force that are sources of happiness in our lives. Gratitude helps us connect with others in a meaningful way. Gratitude reminds us that we are not alone. But we're not always so good at saying thank you. Three scenarios. One, someone compliments us, and we start downplaying whatever it is they liked. Maybe it's humility, but deflecting praise, we fail to acknowledge the person's kindness. Say, thank you. Two, we're running late. It feels awful, and it's disrespectful of the person who's waiting. Rather than stumbling through the door with, I'm sorry, I'm late, which makes everything about us, we can acknowledge the person who waited. Thank you for your patience. And three, someone gives us difficult feedback or unsolicited advice. Whether or not it's warranted, maybe it's terrific, but maybe it's just mean-spirited, we can say simply, thank you. When we thank someone for criticizing us, it immediately neutralizes the power of their position. We've stopped it from going anywhere, and we can use the information to improve or to steer clear of them. Thank you. Gratitude is a spiritual practice. It's a discipline. Gratitude is a superpower. Born in 106 BCE, Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero called gratitude the greatest of the virtues, and more than that, the parent of all other virtues. Science has begun to catch up with Cicero. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, those who subscribe to gratitude are healthier and happier, more generous and helpful. Studies link gratitude with increased motivation, energy, and satisfaction. Grateful people have stronger feelings of purpose, meaning, and connectedness. They have higher self-esteem and better relationships. And they sleep better. So if you're not sure whether or not saying thank you is appropriate, let that go. It is always appropriate. Thank you. What's on your gratitude list? I typed gratitude list into Google and was rewarded with 274 million responses. I loved scrolling through them. I'll share just a few in a moment. What's clear is that your heart can be broken. You can be consumed with anxiety or sunk by depression. But there are always, always things for which to be grateful. The stress might not budge, but when we can take a few deep breaths and remember that we are also grateful, Gratitude gives us the upside perspective and helps us rebalance. Beyond the usual suspects of friends, family, and good health, here are just a few items for our gratitude list. Skewing somewhat to a New England autumn, friends in Florida and other warm places, please bear with us and we'd love to hear yours. In no particular order, we are grateful for laughing, leaves, sunshine, cozy evenings, sweaters, the first snow, electricity and plumbing, smiles from strangers, hot drinks, conversations, books, naps, lip balm, stars, Zoom, fresh air, freedom of speech, old photos, Sunday mornings. After I received my booster last week, someone asked me if I were having a reaction, and the answer was yes, I was having a gratitude reaction. The COVID vaccines also belong on our list. Vaccines and a late entry, goosebumps. Melanie Knight was the founding visionary and director of an aquarium in Newfoundland and now runs an organization that supports coastal communities around the world to open marine education centers. This is her story. I'm 16 and I'm sitting on a plane heading from Mexico back home to Canada. 
My mother's sister and I got bumped up to first class. First class. And I'm sitting next to an older gentleman who's reading the New York Times. We're quiet at first, but when the hot towels come, I start giggling. What am I supposed to do with this? He gives me the gentlest nudge and says, just wipe your hands with it. I thank him, and that breaks the ice. We talk for the entire flight. He tells me he's a Wall Street investment banker and lives in Connecticut. I tell him I'm a high school student from Elmira, Ontario. He tells me about his time in the war and that he went to Yale and about his grandchildren. He tells me how much he loves marching bands, strangely. We couldn't stop talking. We had an amazing connection. So at the end of the flight, I asked if I could get his email because I wanted to continue our conversation. He's so cool. I don't have email, says he's, um, I'm an old school gent. But here, let me give you my address and phone number. And he writes it down on the back of an American Airlines napkin. His name is Tom Fitzgerald. He writes the T in his name with a little triangle hat on top. I have no idea why, but it's distinctive. So we become pen pals. We actually write each other regularly, and sometimes we call. Once, he sent me a package, a VHS tape of a marching band concert. And once, out of the blue, he called to offer to contribute to my college fund. Tom, thank you so much for this generous offer, but we're OK. I mean, I have a big family, but we're fine. I, I hope I didn't give you the wrong impression. That's, that's why I wanted to stay in touch. No, Melanie, not at all. I really believe in you, and I really enjoyed my university experience. I want to make sure you get to enjoy yours. So I talk with my mom about it. I'm like, should we accept this money? And it seems like Tom really wants to be part of my education. So I call him back and I say, yes, that would be amazing. His secretary sends us a check. As soon as I get my acceptance letter to Memorial University of Newfoundland, I send him a copy of it along with a huge thank you. Then I pack up everything and move away. And actually, I thought I had packed everything, but I did not pack the American Airlines napkin. When I realize it's missing, I call my mom. Unfortunately, she has also been packing up. She had upped and moved everything as far west as she possibly could to the ocean on the west coast of Vancouver Island. She didn't keep anything that was not essential to her, so she didn't have any of the letters Tom had sent me. And no, she didn't have the napkin. The napkin was a keepsake. I thought I'd always have it. And now, I haven't written down Tom's information anywhere else. Just thinking about it again stresses me out. So fine, I Google him. The man doesn't have an email, but he must be online somewhere. It turns out there are hundreds and hundreds of Tom Fitzgeralds in Connecticut. I don't recognize a single one. In my first year bio class, I think about him and like, oh, how could I have been so stupid? In my year two genetics lab, I think about him, pit in my stomach. In my year three ichthyology class, he comes to mind again, and I curse myself. Every once in a while, throughout my university career, I Google him again. I wonder, how am I ever going to find him? I think of him, and I tell people our story. In the meantime, what I haven't said is that in exchange for the contribution to my education, he asked for an invitation to my graduation. And my graduation is approaching. I go online one last time. I've got to try to find this guy. I search and search. I can't find him. My graduation comes and goes without Tom Fitzgerald there. Life goes on. I move to British Columbia and get a job at the Vancouver Aquarium. I get married, and we decide to move back to Newfoundland. And I have this idea of starting a catch and release aquarium, the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium. It launches. It's in good hands, and we move back to Vancouver. Four years go by, and Petty Harbor is celebrating its five-year anniversary. I'm going back for the party, and I think this is it. 
This is my chance. I might even have missed it. He might not even still be alive. But if he is, I have to try to find Tom Fitzgerald and invite him to the anniversary because I did something with the education he gave me. At least that's something. So instead of Googling Tom Fitzgerald, I Google private investigator, Connecticut. There are three of them. All three claim they can find your cheating spouse, but only one says they can find a long lost friend. So I call and explain my strange request and I tell him everything I know about Tom, even the part about marching bands. Does that help? I don't know. The guy asked me if I have a sample of his handwriting. I don't, but I remember the way he wrote his T with the little hat on top. He tells me to send him a picture of that and he'll see what he can do. Two weeks pass. He calls me back. He found him. Oh my goodness, how did you find him? Well, I had to do some digging. I called a couple people who weren't your Tom and now their wives are mad at them because they're not sure why someone is asking if they ever gave money to a high school aged girl. But I found him, I'm sure of it. We sent your handwriting sample to his secretary and she absolutely said he's your man. Oh, and he's gonna call you in 10 minutes. I'm thinking, he found him. And then I'm thinking, I graduated without him. Is he mad at me? Is he totally freaked out that I hired a private eye to find him? The phone rings. Hi, Tom, it's Melanie Knight. I know, hello, Melanie, how nice to speak with you again. I explain everything. I apologize over and over, and he says, Mel, I don't even remember giving you money. I don't remember asking you to invite me to your graduation. It's no big deal. And Melanie says, it was a big deal. Tom, you made a huge impact in my life and I've been thinking about you for years. Please know that it was really important to me. And I thank you again so much for it. And I'm so sorry I can't invite you to my university graduation, but I'd love to invite you to come to the five-year anniversary of this organization I started because of my degree, because of how you supported me in getting my education. He was quiet for a beat. Well, let me check my calendar. Let's see, June, another silence. Oh, to hell with it, he says, I'll be there. And so on October 17th, 2017, Tom Fitzgerald is standing in the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium with a party hat on and a starfish in his hand. He is 85 years old. He looks to his left and there is a five-year-old girl who is also experiencing a starfish for the very first time in her life. And they totally smile at each other and have this adorable bonding moment. This is the return on investment I wanted to give him. He finally got it. While he was there, he also had a few other firsts. We got to show him his first iceberg. He saw his first whale. He even met a fisherman with a peg leg. It was wonderful. Tom and I now talk regularly and we have plans to see each other in New York in the spring. And I can tell you now, I have Tom's number and address written down in many different places. Beloved spiritual companions, gratitude is a superpower. If there's an old thank you for a hand that reached out, let's find a way to say it or pay it forward. Just maybe there's a starfish involved. Let's make our lists and not forget goosebumps. May we dance and so give thanks for life. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen. And now for our benediction, I invite you to put your hands over your heart in namaste. I bow to the divine in you. 
These words are from American singer and songwriter Bob Frankie. It's so easy to dream of the days gone by. It's a hard thing to think of the times to come. But the grace to accept every moment as a gift is a gift that is given to some. What can you do with your days but work and hope? Let your dreams bind your work to your play. What can you do with each moment of your lives but love till you've loved it away? Let us keep this faith, beloveds, and pass it on. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. Happy Thanksgiving. I love you. Amen. visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.